So, the next topic is concurrency control and as we discussed uh, earlier, concurrency control goals could be to ensure serializability or it could be to ensure some weaker form of serializability, uh, which a particular application may be happy with. So, how does one control concurrency? Locking is the traditional way, but then there are many variants, um, which uh, we will look at a couple of those. Um, in particular, we will look at a little bit at the multi-version schemes on which snapshot isolation is based and on at snapshot isolation also briefly. And there are other topics in this chapter, which we would not quite cover here, including concurrency in index structures and so forth. So, as you are familiar with locking, there are exclusive locks and shared locks and the standard lock compatibility matrix between exclusive and shared. So, we have the usual lock compatibility matrix um, and uh, locking protocol is a set of rules which govern what you do. Just the fact that you do locking does not guarantee serializability. You have to follow certain rules for locking which will guarantee serializability and the standard uh, uh, locking protocol is two phase locking. We will see that in a moment. And then there are the usual drawbacks of lock based protocols, which include uh, deadlock situations. Again, I assume all of you are familiar. If anyone has any questions, stop me. Otherwise, I am just going to flip through these slides. Starvation is another possibility with locking. Again, I assume you are familiar with it. And two phase locking. Um, what is two phase locking? Uh, the most bare bones version of it um, is that you obtain locks in a growing phase, release locks in the shrinking phase and once you have released the first lock, you cannot acquire any more locks. Uh, so, two phase locking um, has it is easy to show that it guarantees serializability based on the lock point. Lock point is when all the locks have been obtained. In fact, any point between the last lock obtained and the first unlock anything in there can be treated as a lock point and we can show that if you take any point in here the transactions are serialized by that point. So, that is easy and as you no doubt know uh, plain two phase locking unfortunately does not guarantee uh, recoverability or cascade freedom. So, what we normally do is strict two phase locking uh, which says that right locks exclusive locks must be held until commit only after commit can you release it, which ensures that uh, nobody can read uncommitted data items. At least nobody who gets the lock will read uncommitted data items. What about if a transaction wants read uncommitted, then it does not even get a lock, it just reads the data item. Somebody else has an exclusive lock, but this guy can still read it will not cause a problem, but writes the database will make sure can never happen without an exclusive lock that is guaranteed. Uh, rigorous two phase locking all locks are held till uh, commit or abort and in fact, this is typically what is actually implemented because the database has no idea when uh, you are going you are ready to start releasing locks unless you explicitly say unlock the database does not know. So, normally locks are obtained as and when you read and write items and they are released only at the end. So, rigorous two phase locking is what is actually implemented. Uh, this terminology is slightly non standard. If you read database system manuals, they will say we use strict two phase locking. Uh, by strict two phase locking, they mean what at least uh, this textbook uh, refers to as rigorous two phase locking. This is the original terminology which you might consider standard, but in common parlance these days, strict often means rigorous. Now, when does uh, transaction obtain locks? Again, this is the usual thing. Whenever you do a read, you get a read lock. When you do a write, um, you will get a write an exclusive lock, which is an upgrade if you already had an read lock or a shared lock. So, that is lock conversion and the automatic acquisition of locks that is again standard. If there are any questions, ask me otherwise I am just skipping this. Okay. So, next is um, who implements the locking? How, how is this done physically? That depends on the database system, but pretty much all database systems which uh, you know the part of it which runs on a single machine that is in a single shared memory. You may have multiple processors, but as long as they are all running off a single shared memory, the standard way to do locking is to maintain a lock table in shared memory. 
So, um, I do have, yeah, I do not have details here, but again in the book there are details on how to implement the log table in shared memory. But what about access to the shared memory itself? What if two people update something in the shared memory at the same time? So, you need a lock to control access to the shared memory, but that lock is different from a database lock. The normal database locks are held in two phase manner till coming. That lock is a short term uh, thing which uh, just prevents anyone from updating the shared memory while you are updating it. Then you release it even whether the transaction is committed or not is irrelevant. While you are updating the lock table you get a short term lock update it release it. Okay. Then there is the usual uh, issue of uh, deadlocks, what do you, how do you detect deadlocks and how do you resolve deadlocks. Um, and there are several approaches, one is to completely prevent deadlocks. Now, how do you prevent deadlocks? The practical mechanisms for preventing deadlocks which you as a programmer can use are basically to order access to data items. So, if your transaction is accessing items A and B updating A and B. If another transaction updates B followed by updating A, then you are setting up the stage for deadlocks. We have had, I uh, have seen situations where programmers did this and then their system would deadlock frequently. The programmers write two transactions, one of which updates writes B writes A, the other one writes A writes B. So, what happens when they run concurrently? one uh, of the transaction gets a lock on item B, the other gets a lock on item A and then they try to get locks on each other and they are deadlocked. So, this is a bad idea which could have easily been fixed by making sure both of them lock A and then lock B. So, this is something which as a programmer you can do, this is part of maybe tuning or it should be actually automatic, but if it happens that somebody made a mistake and then you detect frequent rollbacks then you can go back and see what is the transaction doing, can I make some changes to these transactions to either completely prevent the chance of deadlock or at least reduce the chances by reordering. Okay, any questions on this? What, what happened? Um, so, if you are uh, if you are looking at real distributed databases today. Uh, so, if you look back at the distributed database literature from a while ago, there are a lot of different schemes. Um, today, what is used is uh, nobody really gives control on locking to external things. If you have a database here and another database there, that guy will never allow you to hold a lock and go away. It, it, it's very bad for him because you can mess him up. So, uh, you cannot really uh, truly distributed systems do not allow locking across different nodes uh, and they are kind of independent systems and at best you can do an update here propagate it there. Um, I, I will leave it at that. In a parallel database there are many things which are done, um, but I would not get into that at this point, but this protocol works regardless. If you order access does not matter whether it is parallel distributed centralized it will still work assuming all of them are doing locking. Uh, people have done a lot of research on what if uh, database A uses locking, database B uses uh, snapshot, database C uses optimistic, how do we ensure serializability in this situation um, and it is actually very hard. So, although there has been research nothing is practical. Um, how do you detect deadlocks? The usual way is you construct a waits for graph. So, if a transaction is waiting for another transaction to release a resource before it can proceed, it is waiting and that you form a graph and detect cycles. Any questions on this please ask, otherwise I am going to continue zipping ahead. You are familiar with all this. Okay. Uh, how do you recover from deadlock? You can roll back totally or you can roll back partially up to the point where you release a lock which somebody else needs and then they can proceed and you can also restart after some time and continue from there. And of course, when you roll back you do not want to kill the same guy repeatedly. So, there are uh, tricks to make sure that every transaction will make progress and eventually commit instead of becoming the victim far too many times. 
Now, the most important uh, extension to locking and one which is very, very widely used is multi granularity locking. Um, again, for a lack of time and also because I think most of you are probably familiar with it, uh, I am skipping this. Uh, but the key thing to note there is that there is a notion of explicit locks and then there is a notion of implicit locks. So, if you explicitly lock the page, you implicitly lock all the records within that page. If you explicitly lock a relation, you implicitly lock all the pages of the relation. And the protocol has to make sure that if you explicitly lock a page, nobody can explicitly lock a tuple inside that page. Or if you explicitly lock a relation, nobody can go in and lock a page of the relation or vice versa. If somebody existing already has a lock on a page, you cannot get a conflicting lock on the whole relation. And how to do that, uh, the protocols are there in the book. Um, if there are any questions on this, we can discuss them. Okay. So, these protocols are all based on locking. We will come back to multi versions of these subsequently. Uh, the other alternative approach is to use uh, timestamps. Yeah, you have a question? Are there any uh, experiments? Hmm. Overhead is uh, little hard. In today's lab, we have some exercises which demonstrate what is going on. They will demonstrate that something waits at some point or that something rolls back, um, but they are not performance tests. They are just to observe what is going on. Um, now, if you want to actually find the performance overheads of locking, uh, you can do that by creating suitable transactions, but even there it is going to be difficult to understand you know the database is a black box. So, what caused a certain performance issue is not necessarily obvious. So, you will have to set up transactions which conflict on data items and then as a result you can show that if they do not conflict there is a certain speed, if they do then the speed reduces. So, it is possible to set up such exercises, um, but the net result will be you will either say running fast or slow. So, maybe a different way of doing an exercise like this may be to create an application which is running slowly and then tell students figure out what is wrong with this and go fix it. It is a tuning exercise. So, you can do tuning on SQL, you can do tuning on indices, you can do which we did yesterday in effect uh, and you can do tuning on concurrency similarly. But the biggest problem in all this is to set up a situation where there are actually conflicts, multiple transactions accessing the same thing. Um, so, in, in the real world, uh, this will happen if there are many different people updating a data item. Um, in a lab where you do not want to create a hundred different processes, you may have to create an artificial situation where two processes are conflicting frequently, although in reality that is not very likely. Yeah, you can observe the you can observe the time taken typically. Um, some databases will also let you observe what are the locks in the database and which transactions are waiting. So, I have not used the latest uh, version of the Oracle uh, things, uh, sorry PostgreSQL, but PostgreSQL does have uh, some monitoring. It can tell you what transactions are there if they are idle or they are waiting and so on. So, you can visualize a little bit of what is going on in the system. Uh, through PG admin there are some options there, you can uh, play around with that. Um, other database of Oracle for example, uh, there are tools which will let you uh, their own uh, uh, the, the S -S SQL developer or other tools like Toad. You can monitor what is happening in the database in terms of locks and weights and so on. So, there are ways to look inside the database to some extent. Uh, other than that, the best you can do is look for weights. You see that a transaction um, went to commit, but it did not come out. It has not completed. It is waiting. You can see that. Or you can see the total time to commit for a set of transactions. It is not easy to create uh, inspiring labs, let us say. Okay. Any other questions? 
So, time stamp based protocols keep track of at what time data items were written and um, what they basically make sure is that no trans uh, and they also assign timestamps to transactions and what they do is um, make sure that no transaction sees the effect of a transaction with a lower timestamp. So, basically the timestamp of a transaction is the serial order in which transactions run. If anything happens out of timestamp order, you roll back transactions. Okay. So, that um, what we need is for this is every transaction must have a timestamp. In the basic timestamp protocol, the timestamp is issued when the transaction starts um, and newer transactions will have higher timestamps. And every data item needs two timestamp values. W timestamp is the largest timestamp of any transaction that successfully executed right. If somebody tried to execute right and because of a timestamp conflict was rolled back, that does not matter. Similarly, uh, read timestamp of any data item is the largest timestamp of any transaction that successfully read that data item. Now, it is possible that a transaction read the data item, another one came after some time and read it. The second one may have a lower timestamp. So, the second one does not actually update read timestamp. For write timestamp, can this happen? Can you have a guy coming later with a smaller timestamp? Well, we will come to that. There is uh, optimization called Thomas Wright rule, which you may be familiar with. With that, it is possible. Without that, it is not. Okay. So, the protocol is fairly simple. Whenever you issue a read, if the timestamp of the transaction is less than the timestamp of Q, uh, then basically T i is trying to read, it, it actually needs an older version of Q, which is not there anymore. So, T i rolls back. If it is greater than the timestamp of Q, then it is reading something written by somebody who is serialized before it. So, it is ok, it can go ahead. And the timestamp is set to the maximum of the original timestamp of Q and the timestamp of this transaction. So, this is what I said. It is possible that transaction with timestamp 100 read the item, then another with 90 comes, which will not even update the time read timestamp. What about a write? Mm, if the timestamp of T is less than the read timestamp of Q, what does that mean? You are trying to write something which this other guy should have read in serial order, but this other guy has already read it and you have come too late. So, you are told sorry, you have come too late, you have to roll back. Okay. And uh, so, that is the first test. The second test is if your timestamp is less than the right timestamp, then what do you do? Again in the basic protocol, this means somebody has already written it something which you should according to the serial order, you should have written it first, then that person should have read it, uh, written it, but they have already done it, you are too late. Okay. And uh, otherwise, you write it and just update the right timestamp. We know it, the right timestamps can only increase with this. So, there is an example here, um, I think for lack of time, I am going to skip it and it is very easy to show that in the timestamp protocol, um, a time transaction with a smaller timestamp has to precede or uh, one with a later timestamp in terms of any conflicts. If this guy, re if, if they both write the item, the one should have finished first and then the other, the later one does it. Similarly, for read write, the ordering will be preserved. So, there is clearly no cycles and everything is fine. Uh, there are some issues, the schedule may not be cascade free, may not even be recoverable. So, then you have to modify the protocol to keep some form of locking um, to ensure this kind of, uh, to ensure cascade less schedules. I am going to skip this, there are a uh, few solutions. Mm, one of which is to do all the writes at the end, that is kind of the default assumption that is done atomically at the end, uh, but then uh, that may uh, lock the database for a long time if there are a lot of writes. So, then there are some further optimizations to deal with that. 
ok, I am going to skip this um, other details and uh, you had some questions about timestamp. Yeah, there are a uh, lot uh, the storage overheads are significant for timestamp because every data item has to have a timestamp in the database um, and the timestamp has to be around until some older transaction has gone away. So, uh, it is possible to delete the timestamps completely if the not if no transaction which is active now has uh, ever has written this object, uh, but that requires more work. Um, so, there are overheads um, in some databases uh, implement versions of it um, mainly for multi version, so that uh, you can uh, we will see multi version shortly. So, there are overheads, but some uh, implement decide it is worth paying the overhead. Okay. The next uh, protocol is validation, which is actually um, you can think of it two ways. Validation is kind of like timestamp, but the exact procedure is different. Validation can also be related to snapshot isolation, which we will see later. Again, there are some commonalities and some differences, uh, but let us see what is validation protocol. So, there are uh, three phases. In the first phase, um, TI writes only to temporary local variables um, and can read anything. What is done is whatever it reads and whatever it writes is recorded. You have a read set and a right set. Um, now, when a transaction wants to commit, a validation test is done to see is it ok to let this guy commit. Again in the basic version of the protocol, this validation test is done serially, meaning uh, you have many transactions, only one transaction at a time can be doing validation. There are some extensions which allow concurrent validation, we would not get into that. Uh, so, validation happens serially. And the validation decides does this transaction have any conflict with whatever committed earlier, if so we will roll it back, if not we will let it commit and it will also write the values into the database before allowing any other transaction to validate. So, the write phase is the last phase when you are writing the updates which it did back to the database until the write point none of its updates goes to the database. There is an overhead to this. It means it should keep, uh, you know, if it writes a lot of items, you have to keep a lot of space to keep the values which will eventually be written back. So, validation actually has a significant overhead. Um, so, most implementations do not implement it as is. Okay. So, um, this protocol is also called optimistic. Why is it optimistic? If you notice, Transactions are never rolled back in the middle. They just go ahead. They read whatever uh, values they can get. They don't do any writes immediately, and until the commit point, they just go ahead. And only at the time when they want to commit, does a validation happen, and then you decide whether to commit or not. So they're very optimistic. They believe that everything will go fine. Whatever value they read will be fine, and they proceed. And uh, if something goes wrong, then fine, you roll back. So, it is actually been shown that under low conflict situations, it is actually a good idea to be optimistic, but there are overheads. So, that uh, if you just look at concurrency by itself, it is a good idea to do optimistic under low overhead and uh, oh, low contention. If there is a lot of contention, many people are updating the same data items, this can result in a lot of rollback. So, it it is not a good solution under that situation. So, how do you do validation? Um, we will skip the details again um, because of lack of time and uh, if anyone has questions about it, we can discuss it afterwards. Okay. Then the next key idea is uh, of multi version schemes. The Key idea so far we have assumed that 
a data item has a value. If you read it, you can read that value or you have to uh, wait till somebody finishes writing the value and then you can read it and that is it. Those are the only two options. You can read the current value, you can wait or you can roll back, that is the third option. With multi version schemes, you can have multiple versions of the same thing, so that you can read a version which you need. And whenever you write the data item correspondingly, you cannot directly go and update the original copy, you can create a new version of it. Okay, so, that is the basic idea of multi versioning and multi versioning can be applied with several different protocols. Uh, you can have multi version timestamp ordering, you can have multi version two phase locking. Um, what is multi version two phase locking? Um, it basically allows, um, it, it creates multiple copies, uh, but readers, read only transactions can use which you know they are guaranteed that whatever copy they need will always be available. So, they will never block, they will always have a copy which they need and they will commit. Update transactions on the other hand use locking to prevent conflicts, uh, that is a very brief summary, there are again details in the book. So, that is multi version two phase locking and multi version two phase locking is actually a very nice protocol because uh, for updaters it guarantees consistency serializability through uh, locking. On the other hand, if you have a read only transaction, it guarantees it will commit without any lock conflicts, it will get a version it needs and commit. Its serialization point may be a bit earlier in the history that is it started at time uh, 11 o'clock, it will see all data as it was at 11 o'clock. In effect, it sees a snapshot of the data as of 11 o'clock. It may run until 12 o'clock. Updates may have happened to the items it was reading, but it will never see those updates. It can completely, uh, you know, see uh, only what was in the snapshot, and of course, that snapshot is consistent at that point, and it will commit. Okay, so that's a nice property. Uh, and for update transactions, they use two phase locking, so they are safe. So, this appears to be a very nice protocol. The only problem is who uh, judges whether a transaction is read only or an update transaction. How do you know? Uh, somebody has to declare it, that is more work. So, what uh, and if you have an existing base of applications. Uh, those cannot exploit it, they have to be rewritten. So, that each transaction has to declare whether it is a reader or a writer. Only read only transaction, if you declare a transaction as read only, it can benefit, otherwise it cannot. So, the snapshot isolation mechanism uh, does something uh, similar, it also gives every transaction a snapshot view. Whatever the transaction reads will be exactly as of the point when it started except for updates that it itself makes. I have slides on snapshot, so I will come to that. So, anyway, uh, coming back. So, multi version, all the multi version uh, schemes have this common property that reads never have to wait. Any questions on this? I am going to come to snapshot isolation next. So, what is the drawback of multi version? There are overheads to it. You need extra tuples, extra space for storing version information, um, although very old versions can be garbage collected. If nobody is ever going to read it henceforth, it can be garbage collected. Um, and again, there have been implementations. For example, SQL Server had a prototype. I do not know if it is in the product yet, but there was a prototype which would store all versions of a data item historically. Why did they do that? Basically, their idea was you can actually go back and see the history of a data item if required. Why would you want this? It may be required for audit purposes. If you see the old uh, pre computerization era, um, I, I mean all our institutions probably still have many parts which are not computerized. People have these ledgers and they write in it. One of the properties is that you cannot overwrite at least without being detected, which is a nice property for preventing shady actions, corruption and so on. On the other hand, once you computerize it, it is very easy to go to the back end and 
up do any update you want and cover all traces. So, the idea here was you keep all versions around and uh, so, if you can later on audit it and see what happened to a data item. There is an overhead to keeping all this around, but if that is what the application needs that is what it gets. Okay. So, uh, that is actually implemented and reasonably efficient. How, are the hmm? How is the decision regarding whether the older version should be in a new suite with the new suite? Uh, whether it is useful? Uh, the application, no the applic any transaction, the application does not know anything about this. A transaction starts, it gets a timestamp, it reads all data items, uh, versions, which are the latest before that timestamp, the latest data item before that timestamp. That is all that the transaction is concerned with. Now, if you uh, have three versions of a data item, one of which had a timestamp 20, one of which had a timestamp 50. And let us suppose the newest transaction in the system is of timestamp 60. So, let me write it here, so that it is clear. There is a data item 20, 50, uh, in, in fact, even 2 are enough. And now, the oldest transaction has a timestamp 60. There is no older transaction and future transaction timestamps can only increase. So, at this point, it is clear that even the oldest one will only read 50. Um, it is not ever going to need 20. So, this can be garbage collected. So, that is uh, most multi version uh, implementations include a garbage collection, otherwise this will keep collecting. On the other hand, uh, this uh, other database I told you, it is called immortal DB, that is the project name, keeps all versions around for audit purposes. Any questions? So, um, all uh, most databases, in fact all databases internally do have locking, but uh, the and they need locking for certain things like read committed. Now, what concurrency protocol they actually uh, provide, they, they give multiple options by setting the isolation level, uh, but if you take DB2 and SQL Server, both are based on locking. Locking is the core. and they also provide uh, some forms of multi versioning and uh, SQL Server also supports snapshot isolation, which we will describe. Um, Oracle and PostgreSQL both uh, support uh, read and committed by default like everybody else, which uses some minimal form of locking. Um, otherwise, if you uh, set the level to serializable, they use snapshot isolation, which I am going to talk about next. Um, MySQL I think uses locking, two, two phase locking as far as I know. Yeah. I do not know if uh, anyone knows if it has multi version at this point. Optimistic uh, is used in certain applications. I do not know if any database supports optimistic directly, um, uh, but it turns out that snapshot isolation actually can be thought of as a, the, it does a validation, snapshot isolation, which we will see. It does, it has a validation phase at commit. And that validation phase, it turns out is similar to um, optimistic concurrency control. So, part of optimistic is implemented as snapshot, although I do not know of any database which is based purely on optimistic. And people have built specialized applications with specialized concurrency control techniques and I am sure optimistic is used in some places because it is quite useful. No, if it is a standalone application which needs to support concurrency, it does not using a database, but it manages some data, then it can, yeah. Okay. So, what is snapshot isolation? Why was it motivated? Um, uh, well known problem earlier uh, was that if you have a transaction which does a large read and you are, uh, you, you just run that transaction, everybody else in the database gets affected and the database appears to hang. If you know, supposing you read every uh, tuple in a relation, 
until you commit, if you are using two phase locking, until you commit, nobody else can write to that relation. And uh, all other users who need to write to it will see their applications hanging. This is a huge problem. I mean, imagine uh, in that, in the earlier era, we did not use, web was not there, but if you bought an airline ticket, um, you go to the airline counter and uh, then they say, the booking system is hanging. Why is it hanging? Maybe it is hanging because the connection went down, but maybe also it is hanging because someone ran a query which read all the tuples in a relation and now you cannot write to that relation. So, this was a major problem. Uh, the solution which should be used, uh, which was recommended in was that any such large transaction should simply use the read committed mode. That means, it does not hold locks. It will hold a lock briefly, release it and move on. But that requires the cooperation of that transaction also, that it does not hold a lock. And that is why the default in that system is read committed. So, even if the transaction does nothing special, it will release locks. So, the reason for default being read committed is to ensure this kind of hanging will not happen. So, there is a trade off. On the one side, you want consistency. On the other side, if the cost of consistency is people cannot book airline tickets, people say the hell with consistency. I do not want to lose the revenue. That is real money. What is consistency? Okay, so, two people got the same seat. Fine, we will deal with it. We know how to solve that problem. The expert of consistency is we did not get money from one passenger once in a while. That is okay. We will deal with it rather than lose all revenue from all passengers periodically. So, um, that is basically why people are willing, it's, it's eventually they care about money, not about consistency mostly, uh, except for auditors. Uh, so, a snapshot isolation, it's selling point, Oracle sold this by saying that um, once you have this, you do not have to run at read uh, committed isolation level, which can cause a lot of problems. You can run at serializable level, but still you will never have to wait uh, in this kind of situation. And that was their selling point. They got a lot of customers based on that. Of course, it is not really serializable, but the benefit is clear. You, it's, the level is not as bad as read uncommitted. On the other hand, you never have to wait. What does it mean to never have to wait? Basically, it is multi version two phase locking. In this, you give a snapshot to read only transactions. Update transactions do not get a snapshot, they run normally. This is what we just discussed. And this works very nicely, but the catch is how does the system know a transaction is read only? So, a transaction runs, it does a read, it does another read, should you give it a snapshot or should it be locking? So, you give it a snapshot and now it does an update. What do you do? Should you roll it back and rerun it? You cannot. Okay, it is a problem. That means that to benefit from multi version two phase locking, people have to declare their transaction as read only or not. And as I was saying, people do not do this necessarily. So, snapshot isolation uh, gives a snapshot to every transaction, um, but if you if only updates um, use two phase locking to guard against concurrent updates, then what can happen? What do I mean by this? The transaction reads some old snapshot of data, but when it does an update, it does locking, regular locking. What can happen? Well, several problems can occur, including lost update. What is a lost update? You wrote something, another guy um, overwrote it without even knowing you wrote it. How can that overwriting happen? It can happen because of a blind write meaning they do not care, they just go and write a value, you know, but that is rare. Typically, what happens is before writing something, you will read it and then write it or you will insert a new tuple, that is different. If you are writing an existing tuple, you will read and then write. So, what you want to make sure is that if you read write, read write, it should not, this situation should not happen. This is what is called a
Okay. All of these are on the same data item A. Okay, now, what is going on here? Uh, the first transaction reads A, the second transaction also reads A from its snapshot, actually both are the same at the beginning. Uh, then the second fellow writes A, it gets a lock. The lock does not conflict with the other transaction, because that is using its snapshot, it is not got a lock. The read does not get a lock, this is T 1, T 2. Now, this fellow writes A and commits and is gone. Now, what does this fellow do? It also wants to write A, it gets a lock. Can it get a lock? Yes, it can. This fellow got a lock and committed and went away. Now, this fellow can get the lock, the lock is free. So, it gets a lock, writes, commits and goes away. Now, this is a classic example of a lost update. Even though T 2 read A and wrote A, it never saw the update of T 1 and it overwrote the update of T 1. This is a bad situation. Yeah. If you try to fix multi version two phase locking by just getting locks, it is not good enough. You get give a snapshot plus only updates get a lock, it is not good enough. Multi version two phase locking works because update transactions get read locks also. They do not just use a snapshot, they get read locks. This variant does not work. So, instead what they did is they uh, in snapshot isolation, the first part does not change. Every transaction gets a snapshot of the database, it any read that it does is from the snapshot. Of course, if it writes the item and reads it again, it will get, it will see its own rights. It won't see other people's rights, but it will see its own rights. But to prevent the lost update problem, snapshot isolation does some form of validation, and we'll see that in just a moment. Okay. So, like I said, this was uh, proposed in uh, 1995 in Sigmoid as a critique of the SQL isolation levels, but it's actually uh, valid though non serializable protocol and implemented Oracle PostgreSQL, SQL Server added it in 2005. DB 2 is uh, added some very poor form of it and eventually they are going to be forced to add it. So, it is very successful that way. So, what happens? Uh, what how is it different from locking? So, any transaction executing with snapshot isolation gets a snapshot of committed data at its start. It always reads or modifies data in its own snapshot. It does not write to the common area at that point. And as a result, updates of concurrent transactions are not visible to it. So, the update and lost update anomaly, which I said, it will almost happen, it will be caught at the very end. We will see how. Now, the rule for a write is as follows. Um, there are two variants. The first committer uh, wins variant says that you can commit if no other concurrent transaction has already written data that this guy intends to write. Now, how do you know who wrote what? What is concurrent? What do you mean by a concurrent transaction? First of all, a concurrent transaction is one which ran at some point concurrently. So, the transaction started here and ended here, this fellow started here and ended here if their time intervals overlap, it is concurrent. That is the definition of concurrent. It is based on the times when they start. Uh, now, how do you know if somebody who was concurrent? So, uh, let me draw it here. Here is a transaction which ran from there to there. Here is a transaction which ran from here to here. Now, the rule of for validation means the validation will happen here and here. This valid, let us say both of them write A. This fellow also does a write A. If you did locking, the lock would have been released immediately here and this fellow would get the lock. But in snapshot isolation, this guy has written it. So, we remember that this transaction T 1 wrote A and this is T 2. When T 2 comes to the end and it validates, it will say, okay, I want to write A. Let me look at all transactions that were concurrent, whether they are running or are committed does not actually is enough to see those which committed earlier. So, um, if anybody has committed earlier, but was concurrent, 
if somebody was not concurrent, meaning um, they finished if, if t not finished even before t 2 started, we do not care about it. What we care about is anybody who uh, overlapped with this and so t 1 overlapped. So, we will see if did t 1 write a, if so it will roll back. If t 1 did not write a, then t 2 does not have a problem with that. So, every item that it writes, it is going to check if a concurrent transaction wrote it or not. So, this is validation. If you are familiar with the validation protocol, uh, the write validation basically does the same kind of thing. There are actually two kinds of validations in optimistic. One is uh, read validation, the other is write validation. And what snapshot does is essentially write validation, but it does not do read validation. As a result, although uh, the validation protocol guarantees serializability, snapshot isolation does not guarantee serializability. Okay. So, here is an uh, example. Yeah. So, this T1 wrote Y and went away not even concurrent with this. Here T 2 started and read x and y and uh, z and then y again. Now, uh, in between T 3 came and wrote x and z and it committed because there was no concurrent transaction which uh, had actually committed by that point. So, T 3 can write these and commit. Note that if this T 2 reads z, what does it get? It will get the original value, it does not get 3 because it is reading from its snapshot. If it reads y, it again gets the original value, uh, now it is writing x and it requests a commit, now what happens? There is a conflict. Is there a read, read write conflicts are irrelevant. The problem is the write write conflict, read write conflict are ignored, even though they are there, they are ignored. Write write there is a conflict because this wrote x, this also wrote x. Now, this has already uh, committed and therefore, this fellow rolls back. Okay, it is uh, called a serialization error in Oracle and uh, PostgreSQL also has some similar terminology. So, a transaction may be rolled back at the point when it wants to commit because of a, um, a validation failure like this. Any questions? No, 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 no. What I mean by does not guarantee serializability is even uh, so the if the rollback uh, happens here, that is fine. That is a case where there was a problem which was detected. The problem with snapshot isolation is there are it's a class of problems which are not detected. I'll talk about it in just a moment. Uh, there are situations where it can lead to inconsistency, and like I told you, uh, the IIT example, I will show you a simpler example. The IIT example is harder to explain. I will give a simpler example in a moment. Okay. So, why is SI popular? Reads never block. Performance is very close to read committed because blocks are very rare, uh, except that there are more rollbacks. Uh, which problem? A read committed does not guarantee serializability anyway. And if you look at the uh, descriptions of snapshot isolation, uh, they will say that they are read committed because you, it only reads committed values. It will, they will even say they are repeatable read because if you read the same value again, you will get that value. But it does not uh, prevent phantoms that somebody had mentioned phantoms, uh, it does not prevent phantoms. Although uh, uh, there are a couple of places on the web where people claim that uh, snapshot isolation prevents phantoms. In fact, it does not. If you are aware of what phantoms is, it does not prevent phantoms. If you are not aware of what are phantoms, forget it for the moment. Okay. And it actually avoids the standard list of anomalies. People have listed common problems because of non-serializability. Lost update, which we discussed was one of them. Dirty read is a simpler one, where you read a value which is not yet committed, that is obviously prevented. Non-repeatable read is prevented, because if you read it again, you will get the same value from the snapshot. 
Um, now, it claims that predicate base selects are repeatable. Uh, this claim is to be taken with a pinch of salt. Yes, uh, what is a predicate base select? If I say give me all tuples with um, name equal to John, there may be multiple tuples. Now, if you run this again, you may get a uh, with plain locking, you may get a different answer. Even with two phase locking, you may get a different answer. So, some extra effort has to be taken to prevent different answers for the same predicate read. Okay. So, uh, the definition of phantom in the SQL definition basically said predicate read should be repeatable. And in fact, with snapshot isolation, a predicate based read, if you say give me all things with name equal to John, it will give the same answer how many ever times you execute it. On that basis, they say no phantoms. But that is only with respect to the SQL definition of phantom. But there is another, some other problem, phantom problems, which actually it has. If you have time, we will discuss it later. But uh, so those are the good points. But the drawbacks are it does not give uh, serializable execution always, and we'll see this. Um, and some integrity constraints can even be violated. So let's look at an example two transactions, very simple transaction. One of them uh, does x equal to y, the other does y equal to x. Okay. Let us say that x is 3 and y is 17 initially. If you run them serially, you can guarantee something will happen regardless of the order. What is the guarantee? Yeah, both will be the same in regardless of the serial order. If um, you run t 1 first, uh, x will become 17 and T 2 will set y back to 17. So, they will both be the same. If you do it the other order, both will become 3. But regardless of the order, we can guarantee that the two values are the same. However, with snapshot isolation, consider what happens. Each of them runs in their own snapshot. So, T 1 will set x to 3, if they run exactly concurrently. Okay. If they run one after another, of course, that is serial. But if they run exactly concurrently, both get the same snapshot, then what will happen? X will be set to 17, Y will be set to 3. Now, at the validation point, snapshot isolation will check if both have written the same data item. Have they? Have they written a common data item? No. So, snapshot will say fine, everything is okay, go ahead and commit. What is the final result? x and y are swapped. And as we just saw, regardless of the serial order, x and y will be the same, but with snapshot isolation, the values have got interchanged. If you want, I can repeat this briefly. They both read the same snapshot. So, uh, both of them saw x equal to 3, y equal to 17. But what they did is, one of them said x to 17, the other one said y to 3, and then both committed. So, x is uh, 17 and y is 3 at the end of this particular execution, which cannot be equal to any serial execution. So, this is a proof that snapshot isolation does not guarantee serializability. Uh, there are other kinds of things. Um, for example, uh, find the maximum order number amongst all orders and then create a new order with order number equal to previous max plus 1. This is a very common thing which many people use to create new order numbers without gaps. Okay, read the find max, add 1 and commit. Now, what will happen here? Two of them can both read the same relation, find the max. In their snapshot, both will see the same max value. Both will add 1 and both will write the same value. They will both create a new order with the same number. This cannot happen with any serial execution. Is that clear? Now, um, it turns out that for most such uses of finding max, the order number is also declared as a primary key. And that saves the day in this case. So, what happens? The primary key is not checked in the snapshot. The primary key validation is done on the actual database. So, the first one will create an order number, let us say 11. The second one will create 11. Snapshot isolation would not have a problem, but primary key violation will occur and that transaction will get rolled back. 
So, it turns out that although snapshot isolation is dangerous in many situations, primary key constraints save the day. It so happened in the IITB example that that thing could not be a primary key because of duplicates. There were multiple records with the same uh, voucher number. So, it was not a primary key, therefore, it did not get detected. Okay. So, I think I need to kind of uh, put an end to uh, concurrency control here in the interest of time. But I will just mention before you ask the question, I will mention what can you do if as a programmer you realize these systems are using snapshot isolation, concurrent uh, serializability is not guaranteed, what do you do? And the solution to that is um, this shown here in this example. Uh, if you do any select, you can append to it a clause which says for update. Now, that for update clause basically um, forces it to get a lock on that uh, data item and it will guarantee if you for, a, for every read in your transaction, if you put add a for update to every read only statement in your transaction, then it will guarantee serializability. There is a cost that it gets locks which may not even have, it gets a write lock, it does not just get a read lock. In effect, it gets a write lock. So, it is like you know every transaction gets write locks on every item that it needs. So, it can reduce concurrency significantly, but at least it will guarantee serializability. So, if you are having a problem, you can add for update statements and solve your problem. To use for update? No, for, like I said, a for update should be used with care. It will mess up performance if you use it all over the place. So, if you keep using for updates all over the place, you will have uh, uh, concurrency problems. You will have very low concurrency. So, you have to use it carefully and there is some research on how to do this. Um, yeah, yeah there is some research papers in, uh, on how to use a minimum number of for updates to guarantee serializability in spite of the fact that snapshot isolation is used. So, that is a good example. If you know it is a primary key, do not bother to add the for update. Uh, yeah. it, yes. So, that is one of the techniques for reducing the number of for uh, update statements added. It is definitely one of the most important techniques. There are a few others. Um, so, if you are interested, uh, I can point you to research papers uh, on this, including one from IIT Bombay. Okay. Um, uh, in the, for lack of time, I will just mention that there are uh, these phantom problems and although snapshot isolation claims to avoid all phantom problems, it does not avoid all of there are several kinds of phantom problems. Um, so, the standard example is a transaction that finds the sum of uh, balance of all accounts in some place and another one which inserts a tuple. Now, both are in the same branch peri rich. If you rerun this, um, you may see a new account in that branch. Okay. So, with locking, there are things to ensure that this kind of conflict will be detected that if, if somebody did this, this insert will have to wait until the first one commits. Okay. So, uh, this has to be done explicitly and DB2 and SQL Server and others do it. Um, however, uh, snapshot isolation actually does not do this. Uh, it, it simply says, fine, if you read this again, I will give you the same value again. It is a repeatable read and it would not actually detect the fact that these two conflict because it is reading from a snapshot. But at the end, there can be a problem because of this situation where uh, this fellow uh, commits and uh, this fellow does not see it, the update. But the, the, the basically, there is a cycle of dependencies. I, 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 I wish I had time to describe this in detail, but I do not. So, I am going to skip those details. And uh, to wrap up, uh, index structures are treated specially in databases uh, and two phase locking is not used on indices. Some other kinds of locking are used to allow high concurrency on index accesses. Okay. Not only do you need to lock data items, you also have to lock indices.
to prevent problems. But indices are kind of special structures and special concurrency control techniques are used, uh, which in general will not work. They won't guarantee serializability. But because of the special way in which indices are used, it is okay. Uh, if I am being vague, I do not have time to explain it. It is there in the book, you can read it. So, if you have, uh, if you release locks on uh, index structures early, what can happen is, um, the access to some of these things is maybe non serializable. But the key thing to note is this point at the bottom. The exact values read in an internal node of a B plus tree are irrelevant as long as we land up at the correct leaf node when you are searching similarly for insertion. So, this is a key insight that low level operations may not be serializable, but at a higher level of abstraction. Yes, I have saw some things which were written by another transaction which is concurrent with me. Serializability says I should never have seen it. Isolation says I should never have seen their updates. What this says is it is okay if you saw their updates as long as your final result, what is the final result? The search on the B plus tree or the insertion. As long as the final result works properly, it is okay to see some things written by concurrent transactions. I, the lack of isolation is not a problem per se. That is a key insight here. But there are some issues with this. The, the fact that uh, we are releasing locks early complicates recovery also. And in the recovery mechanism in the book, um, in the fifth edition of the book for those who have uh, been using that book, it is called the advanced recovery mechanism. In the sixth edition, it is uh, slightly changed and it is uh, called uh, uh, recovery with uh, logical undo or early lock release and logical undo. Okay. So, that is motivated by such situations. Uh, index concurrency control is one, there are a few other examples. Okay. We are not going to cover that in today's uh, recovery part, um, but I just wanted to mention that this has an impact on the recovery algorithm also. Any questions? Okay. That ends uh, this chapter.